there is a purva mimamsa there is a uttar mimamsa between them there is a conjoining called the sankarsha kanda which is also called devata kanda which gives you a nice uh, continuity between the karma and the philosophy this uh, the sankarsha kanda deals more with the devata the nature of the devata the chandas and things like that so the how you, the concrete and the abstract are related or how the action and the principle are related this is the best now these two are always united shiva and shakti uh, they are the two complementary principles that are running the world in now you get down to shiva shakta you have this uh, praka they are interpreted in various ways the they are called prakasha and vimarsha the enlightenment and the discrimination vimarsha is also you know uh, vimarsha is a word for mirror basically it's like he is seeing himself in that mirror so ah. his image of himself in her is the world basically so asuras are not immortal for the same reason because devatas are eternal they go by dharma they uphold dharma and they help people who abide by dharma namaste everyone thank you for joining us for this session this episode of my conversations with my friend and if i may say a little bit of mentor as well in all topics of of related to the indian civilization uh today's topic is uh, devatas is to find out and learn more about who the devas and devis are um this has been uh, shankar has earlier done a talk on murti puja something a topic which is very close to him but i wanted to maybe with all my naivety all by my little understanding not complete understanding of of devatas i've been brought up, firstly born and brought up in north india um with a very heavy punjabi arya samaji influence if you like um and so that's the context of a large part of north india not only punjab or me or all of that um the the we know very little about murti puja it's but you know if you go to my mother's temple for example you will find guru nana to shri ram krishna ganpati lakshmi a whole pantheon of devas devis in her big temple but finally of course when one is praying there is this innate knowing it's all one when it's all one then how do the how do the devatas fit in that why do we do temple worship this thought has uh, helped me learn and understand a lot about murti puja over the last few years this search and i basically this is my my personal journey of continuing on that path and understanding more and in this process i'm hoping that uh, all the audience will also learn more as always uh, please leave your comments uh, once you go through the session and questions so that we can bring it up in following sessions i can bring it up with shankar in the following sessions thank you shankar ji for being here so what i've done here is uh, that i've put together some not the not a comprehensive idea of of what my current understanding is of of the nature of uh, the ideas of god as they are constructed in my mind and they are conflicting sometimes paradoxical also but i've just made a bulleted list of all the things i'm going to first go through all of them hopefully the audience will relate to some of these points as well some of the confusion around this as well and then maybe we can kick off the conversation from anywhere you like in this sure so what i understand and what i do not like i said i've just put them all out here and in just one series of uh, um, of of points so i understand that the concept of brahman which is an upanishadic con- um Uh, concept if i understand correctly and that there is simple consciousness and energy now f- as i understand it is energy which 
arose from consciousness in the beginning there is only sat chit anand which is which is shiva some people call that shiva other times i've heard that shiva and shakti are actually the the purush and prakriti i am not sure if purush should be taken as consciousness or consciousness is par brahma or brahman and then that gives rise to shiva and shakti the purush and prakriti and from them emerge all the other the 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 pantheon of devas and dev, devatas devis and devatas of their own uh, with their own attributes so that confusion Uh, uh, remains a little bit then there is a book in my personal experience many many years ago 15 18 years ago this book came in my life conversations with god by neil donald walsh um some may judge me as having a very christian uh, orientation if you like um, however you know to to advaita if you like but that book actually really opened me up to a some very very terrific ways of looking at the idea of god the book actually helped me break down the fears that one has developed as a young boy which one tends to carry fear of punishment for example right, of being sent to hell and heaven and all of these ideas that you know as kids we do form them and like i said i don't know so much about south india on how uh, you are brought up for example but this idea of paap chadega and um, nark mein jayega all of this is common in at least north india and which i felt now having learned a lot about abrahamic and dharmic religions i feel that this is an this is an impression of a thousand years of abrahamism which which a lot of north indians at least may have adopted uh, having said that coming back to the book um, you know just everything is oneness in a very question answer format right exactly the type of conversation sort of i'm doing with you and with other people in my conversation so it's a very powerful way of communicating messages i found this very powerful and like i said being a hindu these ideas of oneness came very easily to me that everything is one there is no difference between creator and created in fact there is very not really a a creator god idea in the book conversations with god it's actually a a very very uh, as far as i understand advaitic or very modern science uh, um, quantum physics aspect of the idea of god that for example there is no time that is not there right now it's all like all there you're simply experiencing different moments of it in different parallel potentially parallel universes so it's more like that right it's 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 like that but it talks some about some very deep uh, issues of life and and kills this whole idea of uh, of hell and you know and heaven it just just brushes it away shoves it away so i found the book actually rooted in hinduism to be honest it may be written by a an american originally christian but it's a very heavily rooted in hinduism uh, book in in my world view um i developed a very nice i learned about a very nice idea in the book about replacing this word god with the word life and after that this i have tried to teach to a lot of people including my my son and many other uh, uh, people in in my circle of influence so i'll be a little vulnerable here but when i sort of need help uh um, you know there's some trouble or whatever i actually or even without trouble basically other than my own temple and looking at shiva i actually see the same i actually would stand with folded hands in in the night sky and and send out a little prayer for help or whatever right and i see that as mother or shiva or brahma and i i don't really create a difference in my mind and i don't know if that is good bad whatever and i do that i would do that the same thing in goa while looking at the arabian sea for example yeah when i do a little bit achman before i step into the sea uh i i mean that's the relationship i have come to build with what is what the idea of god so <clears throat> with and and it's easy for a hindu 
and actually any pagans i read a very interesting research paper which said that all pagans are able to live with ambiguity far better than any christians for example so i found that so true because you know even though there are paradoxical ideas and whether whether shiva is the brahman or is a the male principle uh, you don't have clear answers but you're okay you're still okay going to a shivalinga and offering jal and praying so that ambiguity exists but it's okay so i'm just calling all all of these things out to set up a context or or at least where i am brahma kumari is very interestingly and i ended up arguing with uh, some of the devis over there in uh, in mount abu some years back where they say it's andakar shiva is andakar mm-hmm. and the shiva the person with form is shankar actually and so which also sadguru also says and but he uses the term shiva interchangeably sometimes so it leads to some confusion in my mind uh, however that andakar idea actually is potentially the brahman uh, the brahmand now does that shiva that that brahmand is is what they are referring to as shiva not sure when we and again the the shivalinga when we go to the shivalinga the linga and yoni it seems more closer to the purush and the prakriti principle which is a very beautiful i iconography if you like of the reminding of divinity and so this is the other question is a shivalinga only iconography or is there more to the shivalinga i have actually tried to ask this question with to several people sometimes got you know spanked for asking that question because it's supposed to be supposed to have that answer of course in muslim forums or wherever you go you you would basically you know they they would tend to use um, abusive language for very sexual slur actually to to talk about hindus worshiping to a shivalinga it's very common in muslim groups if you just scrape the right. surface of goodness it's all there um then as i understand from the principle of shiva shakti emerged the brahma vishnu mahesh and the myriad lower forms if i may say of the devatas as part of that coming specifically to devi and uh, why because yes other than shiva just just the whole idea of mother mother nature or or the seeing life as prakriti or as mother uh, comes equally easily right so if i go to a kamakshi temple which is my favorite temple in delhi which is a i think a attached temple to the kanchipuram kamakshi mandir um very very powerful place i go into very very in, nice intense meditation whenever i sit there um so i am never sure of i mean to me when i look at the devi or worship her i see that murti and see in that murti the entire creation as well i don't know if that's how it needs to be because i've also learned recently that there are that you can't go to a saraswati and ask for strength and uh, valor and fame you have to ask saraswati for knowledge and arts um right so in that sense deities have a specific purpose they have attributes they can only give you something that they are designed to give you or are possible you know uh, and it's only possible to ask them what they can they are limited in that sense they have only limited qualities attributes and so a saraswati might uh, might you can go to a you you can maybe go to kali and ask for fame and valor and power like for example shivaji maharaj with uh, bhavani tulja bhavani if i'm not wrong so i've learned all of these ideas and i'm i'm trying to integrate all of them in my mind uh, that is where i am basically um i also have tended to learn that uh, the devas and especially with anand prasad that devas and devis are probably beyond human perception but they are beyond sense perception 
and they are real beings, sentient beings, who are probably in another dimension, and we have access to them through mantra, yantra, tantra, or perhaps even bhakti of a very high level of devotion, as Sri Ramakrishna had for Devi Kali. Um, the other important thing I've understood is that the devatas do not care whether you worship them, whether you believe them, believe in them or no. The Abrahamic idea, Allah or the Christian God actually asks for being worshipped. Otherwise, if you do not worship, then there is punishment and throwing into hell and all of that business. There is The devatas are not in need of being worshipped. Whether you do or not do, it's your problem. You won't get the benefits if you do not go to a Saraswati asking for knowledge or arts or go to a Kali for having access to something else or uh, other things. So basically the center of us worshipping devatas or doing a puja to devatas is about your own well-being is how I have come to understand it. And um, yeah, and last but not the least, inspired by your writings in either in Hindupedia or somewhere, Anand Venkat Raman, who's been an early speaker with us some years ago, actually talked about uh, this lecture in which he's saying that uh, devas and devis are possibly not beings. And he refers to Dr. Subhash Kak's book. If you give me a minute, I do want to, for our audience, play that video and we'll embed it here as part of that before we go on to your, this is my last point. And he, he says that the, the mantras are basically to invigorate or um, activate your own cognitive processes in your own brain, which possibly give you access to the qualities of that devata. So this is the gamut, uh, Shankar, for all that I know as of now, including all the confusions which I've laid out. I just want to play that video and then we'll go on to your uh, conversations if you're okay creating an app or something. I think for me, or from a kind of intellectual kind of bath sheet kind of standpoint is whether this will help in standard people's understanding of Indian thought, whether it will help in reinterpreting that. Like I know philosophically, there are many different interpretations, but standard people, I think, still have a very uh, concrete understanding of what uh, whatever a deity is or something. So for example, I read this, uh, at least I read a summary of this book by the great Subhash Kak. Uh, called the gods within is rooted several decades ago it says mind consciousness in the vedic tradition where he basically kind of made the point that maybe all these deities are essentially representations of cognitive processes rather than actual objects or something out there so for example like you know we think of saraswati is saraswati like somebody who's there kind of flying in the sky whom you pray to and she'll kind of bless you or is saraswati like a metaphor for the neural mechanisms which uh, make learning possible, make memory possible. We know like there are many specific networks which improve learning and memory uh, distributed throughout the brain. Could it be that Saraswati is essentially the subjective perception of these structures going about their processing, which would mean that if you do Saraswati sadhana, maybe you're somehow activating or improving connections in these structures. And there are some hints which I think suggest that this interpretation probably might be true okay so one is that like a lot of times you see this kind of statement that the deity is the mantra like the deity has a mantra and they said the mantra is the deity and then uh, the shankar bhardwaj kandavali whom i had mentioned earlier he actually wrote this very interesting kind of description on uh, one of his uh, articles so he says the mantra syllables will determine whether the deity is fair, fierce or benign. So, you know, like, especially in the Shakta deities, like some of them are like Ugra, some of them are like very kind of like uh, very pleasant, right? So I just took out this little uh, paragraph from his work. The qualities of a Devta can be seen from the Bijas of the Devta. Each Matrika Bijas quality can be seen in the attributes of Dhyana Sloka. For instance, Bhuvaneshwari was like one of the Shakti uh, uh, forms is one of the most pleasant forms. This is because Bhuvaneshwari Bija has Maya Bija, which apparently is Khreem. And Maya Bija corresponds to Anandmai Kosh. So he says, she is bound to be a personification of bliss because her Bija has Maya Bija. So it's a very interesting kind of a reverse engineering of what the deity is. Like I think a standard understanding would be that there is a deity and then you create a mantra about it or something as a worship or something. But here he's saying that the mantra is, creates the deity. Very, very interesting. The mantra creates the, 
the deity. I'm going to pause this. Yeah. Mantra creates the deity. Please, over to you, Shankar, now. Help enlighten me. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can probably start with your first slide. So as a worldview, uh, there is Devata. We, uh, everybody refers to that word. And then there is a Brahman uh, is most aptly translated probably as absolute. That's the word that uh, Aurobindo also uses. It is basically the unmanifest in its original form, what the essence of the world is. And then we have uh, countless devatas, but the uh, interesting and important thing is, uh, Ramanujacharya says this, the word deva applies paramatma paryantam. So basically you start with whatever divine beings, the illuminated beings are there from the world of the mind, illuminated mind. From there to the ultimate, to the Parabrahma or whatever, to all the layers, the word Deva applies. Which means it's not about individuals or persons that you are referring to. It can mean anything. It can mean the uh, Devata personifications also. It can also mean the most abstract and subtle concept. It doesn't have to be either this or that. Now, the other uh, thing is uh, once we go to Upanishads and see what uh, they are contemplating and speculating about the Brahman. And what uh, we hear about Devatas. We, uh, they are very close. Basically, whatever descriptions we see about the Devatas in the Upakhyanas, the Lalita Upakhyana, for instance, it's not different from the Upanishadic description. So basically, uh, you describe a lot of attributes about it. Or, but or ultimately, actually, in Upanishads, uh, Shankar, too, I mean, I used to read uh, Radha Krishnan's uh, 10 principle Upanishads. Read, it, read not the whole book, but in, I've never been a good reader, but in bits and pieces. And let the Mandukya Upanishad sometime go small, hmm. very small, few translations, very, very powerful. It was all simply about states of. I don't know what to say, uh, awakeness, uh, awareness or sleepfulness or whatever, <laughs> Turiya and, and no idea of God, nothing. It is just simply, I don't know, very yeah, easy we'll, to work. We'll get there, we'll get there. Okay, there. sorry. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but uh, yeah, these are very uh, similar descriptions. Uh, for instance, in the Lalita uh, Upakhyana, what we see, uh, it is very close to Vedantic realities. You give a lot of descriptions about it. It is this, it is that, it is bliss, it is uh, divine, it is uh, full of knowledge, it is powerful, all these things you say. Finally, it, uh, you end up saying you don't know what it is. Yes. So in itself, what it is, you are considering that we don't know. The same applies to Deva. The same applies to the Upanishadic uh, concept. Now, Upanishads have uh, are uh, twofold, right? You have the Upanishana or the Upasana type Upanishads where the Asarva Sirsha or uh, these things where you explain the nature of a Devata, Tattva, Give a Mantra and all that. There is then another set of Upanishads which are purely philosophical. You give this similar concepts, but you explain it more pedagogically. It's more explaining the concept rather than telling you the uh, you know, putting it in a personic way, personified way, if you want to call it that. Okay. And then uh, uh, there is this uh, compilation of Ganapati Muni called the Mahavidya Sutra, which he gave on the Dasha Mahavidyas. There he traces the, uh, so you also probably know that there are 32 Upanishadic Vidyas, right? Uh, the no. Chakshur Vidya is there, the Hara Vidya is there, Parovari is, is there. There are so many uh, Vidyas in the Upanishad where uh, uh, you know you meditate on uh, I as the eternal, as the sun as the eternal, or the sky or the sound, the basic primal principles of the world. You meditate on them and then eventually you transcend and uh, you arrive at the ultimate reality. 
Now, these Vidyas, he correlates with the Dashamahayas and says, basically, he maps that uh, Vedic, then the Upanishadic, then the uh, Tantric, and then uh, there is a natural extension from it with the Gramadevatas and all these things. That we can relate to, let us say, Renuka is there, Chinamasta. So, these he clearly maps. So basically, uh, going uh, what I again keep referring to as the sheets, we find the same concepts across all the sheets of the traditions in the folk, at the semi-formal, at the most formal, in the most orthodox levels. It's the same knowledge, basically. It is made available in different forms to suit different types of practitioners for different lifestyles. Okay. So that continuity is extremely important. Once we make that out, then a lot of these artificial divisions that people make about Vedic, Tantric, all these kinds of dichotomies, they just dissolve in thin air. There is no such real <laughs> distinction or anything. When, uh, for instance, uh, Arjuna practiced the Pashupata, he mm -hmm. also was a Vedic, he conducted Vedic Yajnas. He did, Bhimasena did, Yudhishthira did there. Or conducted a Rajasuya itself, but at the same time they practice the Pashupatas and all these things. Are the Tantric or Vedic? Not, there is no, no such distinction. So Pashupata Vidya for the for the weapons. For yes. His, okay. And that the was Vidya, tan yes. Okay. And they're supposed not to be Tantric, is it? Okay. You have both variants. You have a Vedika Astras also, you have. But once you get into the practice realm, it becomes more uh, tantric agamic in uh, any way. So that, that's the nature of their continuity. The more you get into that Upasana, all these Upasana Vidya start, uh, uh, you know, you get more exposure to them. Now, there is the other aspect is the worldview aspect, what we call as the Darshanas. The Darshana and the Deva are nearly orthogonal. The Deva is Deva. I mean, uh, basically, the best compilation of Devatas you see in the where the Samhita itself. Uh, there they explain the nature of the Devata in the form of the Suktas, the Mantras. And uh, then we have a continuity. You have these uh, Agamas, Tantras, where there is a lot more about the Upasana of the Devata and the various Vidyas of the Devata. So Mimamsa most people would have heard of, right? Uh, there is a Purva Mimamsa, there is a Uttar Mimamsa. Between them, there is a conjoining called the Sankarsha Kanda, which is also called Devata Kanda, which gives you a nice uh, continuity between the karma and the philosophy. This, uh, the Sankarsha Kanda deals more with the Devata, the nature of the Devata, the Chandas and things like that. So the, how you, the concrete and the abstract are related or how the action and the principle are related, this is the best uh, joint if, or the link if one would like to put it that way. G give me that, an example of, of what, what do you mean by concrete and abstract are related? As so described in the, the, you said, yeah. So the karma, you the karma. Have, right? You have the yajna, you do the practices, the procedures are there. All these things are there. There, it's more like you learn this, you do this. The data will automatically be pleased. You will get the fruits. Okay. And all the qualities, good qualities that come with that devata upasana, that they will uh, come. Then you have the Upanishadic reality. The Brahman is there. The Brahman is this. Brahman is that. This is how you reach Brahman. This. This is the nature of consciousness, all these things. Now, people tend to create a dichotomy between these two as the karma and jnana. But this, the Devata Kanda actually shows how they are not two different things, but they have a neat continuity. So here it also explains the nature of uh, different chandas, where you use them, why you use, apply different chandas in your jnana. Uh, the, it is there also you find the, uh, you know, the greatness of Gayatri. And then there are other stories in the other parts of Veda where you, uh, where they say that there are different Chandas applied to get the Soma. They go 
they try to go to the you know higher world they fail they come back then the three legged uh, superna in the form of uh, the gayatri in the form of superna it goes and it actually gets the neck so it is successful in bringing down so any ishti you have to apply that chandas one so this kind of philosophical uh, reasoning is also given there you call it philosophical or you know <laughs> mythological whatever you want to give so it actually tells you explains the relation between the action and the uh, realization they are not two different things action as you do it is bringing with it the realization anyway the devata or that uh, bliss or whatever that is the fruit of the action anyway right i mean the once the yagna is conducted so same applies to all kinds of yagna you can do a japa yagna or you know the homa archana whatever you want i mean those practices are one side but the philosophy of what a practice leads to that is what we find here and this is also where uh, that is why it is called devata kanda in the vedas you are saying that the qualities of the devatas are defined so let's go to sri ramakrishna also and i'm trying to build a connection here so in some of the uh, shlokas in the vedas i believe and once again i've i've uh, heard from different people uh, that for example a description of a devi or even saraswati uh, would be actually with all human physical attributes yeah and it is it is almost yeah and 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 you know the beauty of the devi would sort of come out world view or the darshana aspect so in the sankhya it is the purusha prakriti dichotomy according to sankhya we have those two primal principles from which everything comes so the darshana is basically uh what tells you the causation of the world how the world came into existence and what underlies it and so you have several darshanas there is a mimamsa there is a vedanta then you have the sankhya yoga yoga is almost sankhya but uh, then you have the uh, nyaya vaisheshikas then you have the shankara darshana ramanuja darshana and the pashupata darshana there are countless darshanas pratyabhigna is there so darshana basically tells you this is how the world came into existence uh, then you have those different causation theories there is a parinama vada or the satkarya vada which says that the universe is eternal the seed principles are always existent then you have a arambha vada that uh, nyaya vaisheshikas uh, subscribe saying there is a definite point of creation and all that and then you have one variant uh, which says that Uh, which is basically shankara advaita it is a vivartavada it does not believe in the real transformation of it, it says uh, all that is there is just an uh, is how things appear you can't definitely say this is a uh, real transformation or anything. everything has its own context in that context it may appear real but outside that frame so he brings into uh, picture the these different frames of reality the vyavaharika paramarthika and all that and then uh, each darshana tells you uh, the relation between the individual the cosmic the the world the jiva or the individual and the para okay. there is the eternal principle and then what causes happiness and misery and what is ultimately the way out for you into a, a ultimate happiness because everybody craves happiness darshanas basically are about giving you happiness happiness is in two forms abhyudaya and nishrayasa i mean this at a very high level is the now in this each darshana has a, a theory theory of causation and theory of what underlies the creation what are the ultimate principles and how we are related to them sankhya as part of that it says purusha can be multiple but they are all conscious beings prakriti is single so that is how dvaita comes actually dvaita derives more from sankhya advaita puts this above and says all the diversity comes is all apparent uh, all this is 
the differences between beings you see several beings because these are all separated by the layer called ego ultimately at the essence they may or may not be really multiple so this uh, and then prakriti and purusha are they uh, basically again the causation they give this famous example when a pot is made there is a potter then there is a clay so there are two principles of causation basically the clay is the upadana karana or the substance out of which your thing is coming and then the maker is there who is also the witness of what is happening that often is attributed as the purusha that sounds very similar to the islamic idea of creation that there is a creator and he created something the creation but the creation is not part of the creator is that similar to no. what you are describing because there is a potter who is creating with the 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 mud but the clay is also divine clay, clay is the prakriti the clay is the prakriti and then there is a there is a witness outside of the prakriti yeah. both clay and potter are two divine primal principles both are divine okay so what your origin is divine so you are innately divine anyway and what has created you as consciousness it has pervaded you also right it's not as if it is you are separate from it so re- what is realization in sankhya it is basically realizing that you are ultimately not nature you are purusha so where there is no difference <laughs> in the realized state you are the purusha right this is what is blasphemous in any abrahamic uh, thought yes so and uh, so going further from this uh, then you have this uh, mimamsa you have the where uh, the conception of the universe is a grand yagna all that is happening is two fold guna and karma happen always all the time guna is uh, the na- nature of or the qualities that you have and karma is what you keep doing knowingly or unknowingly once you have perfected on both these things your type uh, your ties with the nature are can be torn down ultimately it's the same realization and all that eventually follow so understanding this world as a yagna is the karma mimamsa or and that is what you see in the purusha sukta in the rigveda so you have this uh, devatas and this nature of the world all these explained in the veda which is eternal everybody agrees and then you have these different darshanas which have different positions on the same thing shankara and ramanuja have different positions on the same purusha sukta on the same gita on the same brahma sutras and on the same upanishads so they are interpreting these things but all of them agree that these are eternal realities so there is one essential nature of the world which can be seen through different windows that is where these darshanas are coming in so you don't have to understand veda either advai in an advaitic sense or a dvaitic sense exactly it can be anything for an upasaka it doesn't really matter for a philosopher it matters you can speculate this way or that way this is more logical that is more logical for you to get your own moksha all that is irrelevant ultimately that reality will dawn on you and uh, you will get your moksha either way through any of the schools so that is why a practitioner level it doesn't matter at all they don't bicker about all these things Mm. this is mostly for the debates where uh, you know the sampradaya to sampradaya they present their views and they dis- debate they uh, refute each other they re- redefine their or reframe their formulations all these things that is a continuous process but that is orthogonal to a real practitioner getting his own happiness that is why you have so much of overlap the same devatas are worshiped by the bodhas the nastikas the you know vairikas tantikas everybody doesn't there is so much of overlap at the practice level 
the techniques are uh, shared the devatas are shared even the nastikas you said yeah nastika is not the charvakas but oh, okay from the vedic uh, tantric uh, pantheon perspective the bauda jaina become nastika okay not exactly in the non believer thing that right? it's basically the assertion that uh, veda is the axiomatic source of knowledge and belief in the varnashrama dharma if you subscribe to these two then that is an astika darshan okay if you don't it is an astika the astika or na- na- being nastika is actually is a centrality of the vedas largely rather Accepting than the veda as the pramana and uh, varnashrama dharma oh wow subscription to varnashrama dharma so strangely at the practice level bodhas also did not actually try to demolish varna or anything right at the social reality they had no problem they did not take this as their philosophical premise so that's also another thing we need to understand it's not as if bodha came to reform this social institution or anything they did not do any thing like that but at their uh, a uh, philosophical premise they don't take this as a, a common denominator or their axiomatic knowledge now going back this uh, slightly different from this prakriti purusha is the shiva shakti duality it is related but not exactly the same now these two are always united shiva and shakti uh, they are the two complementary principles that are running the world in now you get down to shaiva shakta you have this uh, praka they are interpreted in various ways the they are called prakasha and vimarsha the enlightenment and the discrimination vimarsha is also you know uh, vimarsha is a word for mirror basically it's like he is seeing himself in that mirror so ah. his image of himself in her is the world basically wow beautiful so this is how the uh, shaiva darshana puts it so yeah each of these is a very beautiful way of putting things understanding the ultimate reality and uh, the continuity aspect again is interesting we go from there this uh, you get this complementarity principle of complementarity two principles are there they are all always in an interplay one makes up for the other and uh, one is inseparable from the other and then uh, you see the similar principles in uh, uh, the veda you see the similar principles in your family life you have a head and a center of the family the male and female principles mm. they are inseparable are are they the same exactly from one perspective they are the same at one level and at an operational level you see from the uh, below at a action to action level they seem very different they seem very different but head and center are not really separable they are complementary one doesn't exist without the other on occasions you see the same uh, entity performing both the roles Uh, not many relate to this but if you see the role of indra and agni in uh, the veda in the samhita probably it uh, amounts to the same one is uh, you know about mastery and other is about the sustenance the divine will that from which everything else emanates and all that you can see this in another way the absolute uh, nature of existence and the pervasiveness the one that expands and spreads into the creation is one and the essential principle is one mm. this is another way of looking at it yeah the seed and the you know the bijakshetra whichever how many ever ways there are countless ways to say this sure okay so the principles that we see in life like complementarity or uh, you know evolution nature of evolution all these things these come from the that world view or the view of what we understand about the essence of the world or the nature of the world and all of these qualities exist by principle of causation in what has caused the creation mm-hmm. 
that is where the theory of causation is important we say that anything that is there in the effect has to be there in seed form or in manifest form in the cause so all the qualities good qualities that we see in the world are basically here because these qualities are there in the cause of this creation and the bad ones and the bad ones no because there is nothing like bad there is only yes. what you know and what you don't know yes got it what is not known so in a evolutionary stage when good has not manifested that is the stage of bad once the light comes the darkness goes yeah so that is where this vidya avidya all these things are there very nice yeah and there is a order to this world there is, that order is called dharma the order by which all these things function and evolution eventually happens by the same order and devatas are the those beings that always try to uphold that dharma and they favor those beings that work in favor of dharma and so equally then are there asuras who do not work there in are. favor of dharma no no so asuras are not immortal for the same reason because devatas are eternal they go by dharma they uphold dharma and they help people who abide by dharma asuras are not immortal asuras are beings like all other mortals they have uh, tried to uh, tried the, for their own abhyudaya if you want to say and they wanted to get superhuman uh, powers or limits or whatever they and they also had a huge caliber um, as individuals grow they do get with their hard work they do get a lot of success a lot of power now is this transcending into what human naturally should evolve into or is it not that is where the asura non asura distinction comes so each asura you see that uh, ego eventually taking over and uh, the goals that the being has become unnatural or misaligned with the dharma that is where they become uh, asuri in the essential sense there is asura or rakshasa or also not uh, negative innately negative in the purana you see more uh, a dichotomy deva is positive asura is negative but even not exactly right you still have good ones like the bali those people who are not killed bali so prahalad all this but why then why do they have a connotation of asura attached to them at all that's what asura itself is not uh, negative in the uh, uh, in the creation in the sequence of creation asuras have the same source they also come come from the prajapati so devatas and asuras both come from prajapati yes which is brahman which is brahma is no prajapati prajapatis can be many the father of prajapatis is brahma brahma okay so prajapati is the father right then the grandfather is brahma that is why he is called pitamah okay prapitamah is the great grandfather that is vishnu okay so that is one of the thousand names now of vishnu okay prapitamah anyway uh, so it's not as if the source of these is different from the divine asuras also come from the same source who is the father of madhu and kaitabha they come from vishnu only but they uh, they have come from certain uh, uh, by products discarded by products so they eventually become negative then they have to go back to the same source anyway after and the route to going back to the same source is via human form yes i mean yes. human or yeah asura you call it human or non human that is you can debate it but 
no but going back to the same source is it is it via the so the reason i'm bringing this up is that i've also heard that indra is not a permanent i don't know how Correct. to call this one yeah, person yeah. or that one portfolio story. changes yes yes yeah yeah it keeps changing so there are different i don't know is it souls or which keep taking different forms of yeah indra is a yeah. portfolio it's a position okay so you can chatakra to right you can do those 100 uh, yagnas uh, and then become an indra sometime in the future or you can become a manu or whatever so you can also become a manu yeah yeah so that that is what the chandi saptashati that story is about him no? so human beings can become ha huh, so Indra. the story is to uh, people two guys one is that uh, samadhi who is a trader the other was a king he eventually becomes uh, a manu in his subsequent lives okay so manu is also a portfolio it's not one person no that is why they have a fixed duration manvantara ah manu and manvantara swayambhu savarni all these manu each so, manu has his manvantara and manvantra so where does the manu smriti in this case fall it's basically there will be a lot of uh, uh, controversy because there is too much of historic baggage associated with the manu smriti uh, assigning it to a human being and say that it has come at certain point in time now we follow it we don't follow it all these things manu smriti what is its uh, length in uh, and applicability in time and space all these things become uh, very arguable so <laughs> that's why i'm not going there yeah so but, but yes we are all manavas manushyas because we come from manu okay but all manu, creation, manu all is also uh, comes from manus but manus also is a non human uh, non human beings yes, yes they are so in the same in the sequence of creation right and then you have the hiranyagarbha then you have the prajapatis then you have these manus uh, then you have the devatas all these things very interesting so my conversation with uh, uh, anand prasad uh, he so we, yeah so like i mentioned earlier in my in my ppt that the the episodes of durga killing mahishasura for example the nasura all of these uh, magazines like caravan bring it down to saying that durga was an aryan woman who was killing a dalit yeah, yeah. all this nonsense so he is actually saying these are happening at a non human level they are they are happening a different realm they are stories from there and yes. they are real they are not real is a different matter but they are they are stories from there which humans are telling yeah so you, so you agree with that eh? okay. the rishis narrated this story right uh, and then uh, in that story the devata speak then they'll speak what they are doing to uphold the dharma basically slaying asura is what you are upholding dharma you are destroying a dharma so the so basically of there is dharma a... and adharma continues at a non human realm as well at all yes, levels yes. so okay again uh, earth is the plane of happening where the most manifest uh, results are visible but this game has been played earlier in the higher world and whatever we are seeing has already been played somewhere we are just enacting it as an outcome of that play whatever is in our hands that is why the nimitta matra word is there we enact it but it's not as if we have governed this play neither our life nor what is happening on that right the devatas play and then outcomes are on there so if the devatas are struggling to overcome asuras it is basically what's happening on there as a result of it will be that dharma is struggling on there that is when you have this avataras coming in and upholding all that thing happens 
now is it humanly uh, you can interpret them or not you can definitely interpret them so there there you, there is a dichotomy uh dichotomy of the, what is adarsha and what is uh, uh, a leela divine works in these two forms let us say rama has come down he has lived an adarsha he what he does we can literally follow and say that this is the, i follow him this is an adarsha i can live by that line then there is a leela what uh, krishna did in the rasa and all that is why it is called a leela that is not a you know model for emulation and he is pretty clearly saying it that it is not a model for emulation so there is simply no scope for confusion in the purana what is to be followed what is not to be followed beautiful and this is where lot of controversy is created uh, that's why i'm trying to <laughs> can you also do like krishna all these things it has been pretty clearly said what can be and what cannot be where krishna lived like a human he had worshiped the learned ones he worshiped the cows he respected the kings and uh, learned ones he maintained his uh, diplomatic discourse even when he talked to the asuras so all that is human conduct an adarsha that has to be followed and krishna lived that adarsha perfectly just as perfectly as rama he did not cut any corners anywhere and then there is a adarsha non adarsha realm the leela realm where anyway all this this uh, trying to learn all this is not there this is basically we uh, in our own process of transcendence try to understand this and seek out the divine now okay we were probably on the uh, duality and all that the shakti shiva principle from there then uh, uh, the next point you had or the next slide probably was around the devata is it a world or thing uh, right and how do you see the world inside a devata that was your point then the mahavid mahadasha vidyas of satvik tam say i recently learned about this that there are actually uh tamasic uh i don't know devis if you like matangi for example i learned in the, among the dasha mahavidyas now that surprises me completely why would we call tamasic tamasic is actually inertia it is taken as a negative quality in human beings vekanand swami kept saying <laughs> for example tamasic pravritti you know it's always yeah. regarded so, as negative all the three are there in the world Hmm. and people are also of all the three types humans this is actually we also need to connect to the concept of varna varna is there in the universe at the micro level devatas have varna flowers have varna grahas have varna everything have varna it's oh, basically wow. how you look at the world it's not as if that is the innate nature if that is there in the prakriti your source it has to be there in every of its manifestation also every being will have these qualities there is no way they are not going to have these qualities now once you have acknowledged that they have these qualities you need to deal with it you can't ignore it so to understand these three qualities and then to ensure that the path we are laying down suit all these uh, people of all these three qualities in their own evolution moksha is there for everybody every being human or otherwise tamasik or satvik everybody has a way to moksha and you can provide it only when you understand what their nature is so the ruchi adhikara all these things are there no based, based on the swabhava of each being you need to be able to cater to each of these that is when your uh, philosophies or practices are universal otherwise we cannot cater to the whole society or the whole of uh, creation mankind to be specific but not exactly even limited to mankind when uh, the rishis saw the universe in certain way their scheme of uh, abhyudaya or nishraya saw was not limited to just one section of humanity or even humanity itself 
they understood that this is all a continuous evolution from a snail to brahma or from a uh, you know abrahma kita paryantam right so from ant to brahma every being basically is following the same journey towards the divine in evolution there are at different stages so this binding and liberation are applicable to each of these and one could actually get that ultimate uh, liberation from the cycle of birth and death in any form oh i and didn't being i, in I thought form. it was i thought it was only at the human form level that is why the human form is so sort of elevated no. or talked about so human, that no human is most enabled in that journey so it is so most isn't, likely isn't it have, true that you the devtas have to take human form to evolve human is the most enabled form where you can bring the major transformation but let us say you have brought mag, uh, most of the transformation where you are very close to breaking the cycle your karma nivritti is nearly done there is an ounce left for that ounce you may not necessarily need to have taken a human birth it could be in any form that reminder if it is just a matter of paying that reminder there is no further evolution you would have required that could have happened even without you realizing that it is happening right i mean when somebody does a serious sadhana a lot of karma kshaya happens the destruction of old things happen without even your knowledge so there is no determinism in that you have to take this form and do only this thing and in continuation it is obviously also cannot be not going to be limited to a certain section of humans with certain qualities ha huh, they are definitely better enabled than other humans just like humans are better enabled than non humans okay so in continuity yes you have the devatas you have the manus you have the vyasa and then you have a range of other beings there are valakilya rishis there are various i mean beings that we don't even hear the names of so vyasa sorry once again it's not one person one rishi vyasa vyasa, vyasa. vyasa has bigger lifetime than the devatas so what is the ved vyasa story that he was born uh, he grew up himself uh, born as a child then within just a little there is time. a human context there is a human context to everything there is a human context to avataras and devatas also what, what do you mean Vaipana, you know? krishna dwaipayana is a vyasa which has done that job at this time vyasa portfolio is not limited to that and there is a bigger cycle where the devatas operate then there is a bigger cycle where the prajapati operate then there are bigger cycles where the you know hiranyagarbha operate and they have their own days and they have their own they battles have, of their own up key parameters yes so that is why one brahma day becomes i don't know uh, how so you have different yeah, there are all days. different worlds and each world has its own time space parameters its own uh, nature of uh, visible uh, day and night all these things exactly the your the brahma day and then you have the divine day which is one year here so the night is through our uh, second part of the, the dakshinayana then you have their day in our uttarayana all these things hmm this also i read recently that the uttarayana and the dakshinayana are actually a day and night cycles day and in, night in another divine, okay. divine day yes which is in the realm of devas so understanding the world and understanding devata are not very different if you have understood the, the devata it's basically like uh, that uh, that's why i kept this for the later portion is apart from the sankarsha kanda and the uh, the samhitas and the agamas the one thing we need to really a quick way to understand all this is the dhyana shlokas of devatas let us say uh, bhuvaneshwari as you took that example you took that example it was in your uh, yeah. anand video <laughs> so four hands sitting in a padmasana and then the radiance the color of the radiance is uh, like dawn 
four hands two with the varada and abhaya two hands holding the that uh, pasha and ankusha which basically ayudhas are very important then once the ayudhas are there the hands legs all these things then the hand, uh, heads and then the color of their radiance all these are very important these throw light into the yogic aspects and then the bijaksharas are there they tell the nature of uh, that uh, you know that being and beyond all this is the ultimate existence of that devata which is not exactly that personified form anymore once you have transcended all these things so as you as the sadhana progresses you, as you understand more and more subtler aspects of the devata your mind expands into understanding the subtler aspects naturally you will understand that it's no more one personified being or anything yes that personified being stage is definitely there but the same eternal existent uh, principle whatever you call it has descended through all these worlds in various forms so if you want to uh, give an example from engineering right the the computer world the best example probably would be your uh, network stack it is the same data consciousness at each layer for it to be decipherable you put a frame to it one packet header or something within that frame it is understandable so at, at the intelligence principle it makes sense in certain way probably the most abstract way then you have the level of mind where the bhavanatmaka and then this pandanatmaka in the vital world it's basically through the resonance or the vibration that you make sense of things so your the way the senses operate the eyes ears all these things so at the world of senses it is the pandanatmaka the, the mind you have this as a bhavanatmaka the sense of feel but it is the same consciousness what you are uh, experiencing through the eyes is the same thing you are experiencing with your intellect and your mind everything it's the same consciousness that has descended through all these layers but experience you as a being you are experiencing through different faculties in different ways not because that essential thing is different but owing to the difference of these upadhis or the uh, or the vessels into which that is descending so just like in your uh, network stack you have a data link uh, layer where you have a frame within that frame you can understand this is the data i don't understand what is inside it that is bytes coming but i understand this data link frame then you have a network frame you understand that you don't understand what is about that you don't understand what is the tcp data you understand only what is the ip data so how your senses are equipped how your mind is equipped how your intellect is equipped, based on how you are evolving from within you are able to make sense of the same thing in a different way so the same word start appearing very differently to you same life start making very different sense to you if you are a mind being instead of being a sense being. personified being say kali and in the case of sri ramakrishna Uh, in his journey of of course he he probably had visions much earlier as a young, young boy of 10 or 12 when he saw saw cranes flying over his head and got into a trance and, and then he discovers kali and so sort of starts relating to her as the as the mother and the creator of this whole universe and then starts to see kali what you're actually saying is that he goes beyond the personified being or stays with her even if he stays with that personified being it probably the difference is there is no difference anymore or is it no, that so he, or you're saying that he is actually going beyond the personified being that is where the magic is that is why those words those shlokas or the mantras or the rupa descriptions they are magical because those words are exactly applicable at all the realms when you see it as a personified being same description applies 
when you see it at the eternal level the same exact uh, terminology applies but it makes a very different sense to you at that level so you put it in a uh, let us say you have transcended all these levels say the same description exactly applies there also ultimately the same uh, uh, bhuvaneshwari is uh, eternal when all these uh, uh, lower uh, forms don't apply let us say the same these two weapons are there and the varda bhaya are there for a practitioner it is basically you pray to her uh, you will be free of all fears you will get all whatever you want but the same and then the pasha and ankusha basically you can overcome your uh, uh, limitations like anger and uh, desire or whatever are happening with these things you are you will be put out of those limitations so that your suffering is gone right this are is one they, level of this are they simply bijam are they simply mantras uh, which are a personification of different attributes of the same devi or is does the devi exist as different rupas one which will get rid you rid of fear for example uh, it will it will that's what i am saying maha saraswati so, it seems as matangi it's a tantric form of saraswati is what i recently learned during the recent navratri chaitra navratri yes, she is mantrini so the knowledge and then you have so many vidyas uh, sangeeta matangi all these things then there is lagu shyamala so, then matta matangi all okay, but so at the see, level all, of the devas at the all these forms are real they will be relatable in in the taijasic world in the world of illumination or the world where the thought apply thought forms are there illuminated thought forms are there not the physical beings there you can see them as beings but above that world beyond the tejas when you get into these still higher worlds they are not these personified forms anymore but the same exact description applies there also if you have properly understood with your sadhana once you have transcended from the all those four levels of vakra right the para pashyanti madhyama vaikri once you have transcended the pashyanti layer also in the para layer the same exact description of will apply in a very different way it becomes para brahman all the description you see in a sahasranama or dhyana shloka applies exactly to para brahman as much as it applies in the lower layer is it the devata that is transcending no you are transcending so you are seeing the devata in a different way in a more subtle and more subtle way so ultimately devata does exist and does not exist the same rishis who have said that this is all absolute the brahman they have also created these schemes of devata said right? you have the dikpalakas graha devatas you have the lokapalakas then you have the vishve devata so many groups have been created why they also know that it is the same thing it is the same people who said all these the same who have created these distinctions also because these schemes actually what uh, are what apply to your life to elevate your life so devatas actually uh, i mean i think in the muti puja also i said the same thing divine is ultimately divine it doesn't need to assume any qualities it has assumed so many forms for the sake of the sadhaka to elevate him so it can take any form based on your nature if you are a sattvic being it will take a pleasant form or it can take a fierce form it will take countless forms from time to time from uh, space to space you new mean, forms will also come that depends on the condition of the humans in that era i don't even know what an era would mean here then so what is an era when a durga is being created by the devatas there is a eternal stories that kshira sagara madhana or the uh, shumbha vadha or whatever mahisham vadha all that can happen at all times at all places in your own life it would have happened for you when you were born so it's an eternal story did it happen once in history not exactly it's not a historic fact it would have happened in many forms 
countless forms so far did it happen oh yeah so many countless times so is it real yeah it has been real but are you mapping it to one queen and king and one uh, uh, war in history in a chronological sense it doesn't make any sense it may have been but it doesn't matter because even let us say historic krishna existed what, what do you have to do with him anyway what you have to do with is the vasudeva that is eternal before the krishna came and after the krishna came even before krishna came there was krishna mantra and uh, so uh, again so many mahayugas so many vasudevas would have come or in so many forms they would have descended and then each of them would have uh, given rise to a different set of uh, mantras upasana vidyas they would have set a different example at different times so i mean we are too limited to make a uh, statement conclusive statement about what the divine forms would be in uh, the vast time and space right so many rounds of creations would have happened so many places are there in the infinite universe where creation would have happened in so many cycles what exactly does human know here that he can make a call on all that so that is exactly what you see in the puranic stories finally the brahma or the these trimurtis go and they will discover a higher form like parashakti or sadashiva or mahavishnu who is actually creating these trimurtis and appointing them saying you are creating these worlds and dissolving this is your limited space in time but so many such trimurti combinations i would have created by now you don't even know their count and that transcendental form is what we they call uh, i mean in the devi bhagavata it is the parashakti whatever so basically and again each devata vishnu can be the same thing shiva can be the same thing so whatever we relate to in what we have seen we can attribute to that the ultimate principle and then finally these trimurti say that uh, we give up we, we can't even understand can anybody conclusively say this is exactly the nature of reality impossible but what we are really concerned about is our life how we get happiness how do we live a meaningful and purposeful life how do we make life happy instead of miserable for that all the sadhana margas are there so yeah uh, actually going back to your question time and space do specific forms come from time to time they are the avataras think going by the nature of what is happening on the earth right now if certain form is required the, the divine will come in that form the avatara or avadhuta are based on what is the requirement at that time that is called divine will right by divine will the divine designs for certain purposes that the divine uh, self intends and there you have all these uh, elevated men like the rishis they can see that they understand it some of them are appointed to serve certain cause saying i will come down now you will go there and you will appear to me and you will give me that 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 so you all become the uh, means to fulfill my purpose so all this game would have been played already in the divine world and people with certain tapas can see that so that is what we see in mahabharata right i mean when draupadi story comes then narada vyasa all these people explain see this has already been played out uh, this is an outcome so this five indras all those stories are told to her there are five indras they have done this they had this curse so now the shri will come down on earth and she will marry five indras all that thing and then there is a human context uh, for her in the previous life she would have done tapas all that. so yeah the point is there is a causation and causation is understood by people who have invested in the knowledge of that causation so we don't think that the happenings are random 
and we get a better understanding of what is exactly happening now though we think it is wrong we will understand that it is happening exactly perfectly according to a more systematic scheme if we have transcended and understood that and we cannot definitely understand as individuals the whole scheme of the whole world the best we can do is we understand our own causation say that my life is like this because of this, this, this. yeah yeah that I'm... that is what the sadhana they recommend right say who you are meditate on that all these things simply the varna could actually become another big topic and and the uh-huh, guna yeah. the gunas and the varna ashram operating at the universal level my god first time i've heard this now all this all this business of um um shudra all this narrative just collapses completely <laughs> in context yeah. of that yeah i could be anybody i could be a i don't know what uh, how maybe outside the varnashram somebody like an untouchable but it's all, only in my journey right now towards evolution which also maybe i chose this experience at this point in time and maybe in another life i may choose another experience of a different one somebody else in a different varnashram so we'll okay. maybe touch upon this as a, a, sure. in one of the next uh, as one of the next uh, topics to discuss sure. little... so what i would say as a continuity of this is uh, once we have mapped these worlds we those seven worlds are there now where we the world of uh, the the physical vital the mental then you have the vijnana and then you have the sachidananda all these layers this is our world view and we say human transcends or every being transcends through this how the abrahamics actually see the world that is where your source is there your source is bliss their source is sin mm-hmm. so that's the point you are initially saying right that but, but papa bhiti we have we have daiva bhakti and papa bhiti we are fearful of bad conduct and we are devoted to the divine we are not god fearing abrahamics are god fearing that is the main difference we did a talk recently uh, on this so yeah okay. so, very interesting as a way to position these uh, you know two pillar diverse philosophies and uh, then make a contrast and relate them to the lived reality and then our policies and all these things can come out yes of the dharma rajya very good thank you very much shankar